the theory day at the Open University is always something that we all look forward to, so I'm very happy that I uh, have the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm going to tell you about uh, a joint work uh, with Elad Ramati and Zohar Karmin. Um, these are pictures of Elad and Zohar. Elad is a postdoc at Northeastern University, and Zohar uh, is with Yao Research. They are both uh, not only very smart people, but very funny and happy people. So it's really fun working together and spending half of our meetings just laughing at stuff, which is really cool. Um, and I'm going to talk today about optimal dynamic distributed MIS. MIS stands for Maximal Independent Set. And this is the outline of my talk, the direction of this arrow. Okay, so I'm going to first sort of break the ice and remind everyone what a maximal independent set is. Um, why it's not extremely interesting um, in the sequential case. It's very easy to find a maximal independent set in a graph. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit why it's very interesting and a very central, uh, actually open problem in distributed computing to find a maximal independent set. Okay, so I'm going to describe that a little bit. Um, then I'm going to turn over to the dynamic case and talk about dynamic, um, the dynamic setting in which the graph changes and we still want to maintain an MIS. And then I'm going to tell you about an optimal solution, which is always fun to have. Um, I'm going to assume no knowledge in distributed computing, just, you know, basic, I don't know, just you basically need to know what an MIS is and I'll remind you what it is. Um, but please ask questions, okay? So I'm, I would really uh, prefer that you ask questions as we go and not just wait till the end and, you know, you can just stop me and ask questions. And, um, I think it's a very easy talk. I'm not going to get into all the, you know, the math details where you don't understand the notation. We will have some notation, but not a lot. Okay, so really ask me whatever you don't understand. Um, the statement, the main statement will be truly easy to understand, and I think that you can get the flavor of the proof uh, pretty well. So I'd be happy if you stop me and ask questions. Um, okay, so I'm ready to start. So let me remind you what a maximal independent set is. So my problem is that I have to move when I speak and I don't want to uh, block uh, the view of the slide. Um, maybe I'll move to the other side. So a maximal independent set is a set of nodes in the graph that is independent, meaning that no uh, two nodes in the set are neighbors. I'm calling them black nodes and the other ones I'm going to call white nodes, just so it will uh, be easier to speak about them. Um, so it's, a, it's an independent set in the sense that no two nodes in the set are neighbors. And it's maximal in the sense that you can't um, add any more nodes to that set. So it means also that it's dominating. So any node that is not in the set, any white node, has a black neighbor. So I can't add it to the set. Okay, so that's a maximal independent set. Um, it's a very easy task to find a maximal independent set in the sequential setting. Right, because you simply go over the nodes in any arbitrary order. Um, let's say we have an order of the nodes over here. Um, and you simply decide for each node uh, that it goes into the independent set if and only if all the nodes that are its neighbors that you processed already are not in the independent set. Okay, so um, I don't know if this works. Okay, so node one over here goes in, then node two goes out. 3 goes in and then 4 and 7 go out, 5, 6, and here I changed the order. This is deliberate. I'm going to use this example throughout. Um, so I wanted it for a specific reason to be in the opposite order, okay? So here 8 goes in because I process it after 7, and then 9 goes out. That's why it's, that's why it's a bit different here, not, not 9 goes in, okay? So but you could choose any arbitrary order of the nodes, um, process them by, one by one, um, and then you get a maximal independent set. It's, and this takes you a uh, time that is linear in the size of the graph. So that's basically the best you can hope for. Um, and what I, I just want to um, mention and sort of emphasize that this is not maximum independent set, okay? So finding a, a maximum independent set is an independent set of the largest size in the graph. Okay, that's an NP-hard problem. It's even hard to approximate it. So that, that's a very hard problem, not the one that we're dealing with here. Okay. Um, are we all, we all good with maximal independent set? Okay, good. Um, so in the distributed setting, um, it's a very interesting problem. In order to convince you uh, about that, I'll tell you what the setting is. Okay, so basically we have this graph 
and we're assuming that it's a communication network. So in each vertex or each node, I'm going to use vertices and nodes interchangeably. I mean the same thing. Um, at each vertex, I have a process. And the processes um, communicate with each other by sending messages. Um, it's a synchronous system, so we have rounds, and everyone has see the same. Everyone sees the same global clock. Okay, so we have round, round number one, round number two. They're all awake at the same time and see the round numbers. They have the same sense of time, and in each round, this is what we do: we send and receive messages from all our neighbors in the graph, and we do some local computation. Okay. Um, and here I'm even going to assume that I don't care about the size of messages. Though, in fact, our algorithm, I, I won't have time to go into all the details, but we will need uh, very little information. But even you can assume that you can send how many, uh, whatever number of bits you want to in each round. That would be fine. Um, OK, so um, what, what, is, what, is, what does it mean to find an MIS in this distributed uh, setting? It means that each process at each node needs to output whether it's black or white. Am I in or out of the set? Now, I don't know the entire graph here, OK? Uh, I only know who my neighbors are, OK? And at the end, I still don't know what the graph is, and I don't know what the, independ the maximum independence set is. I only know my output. Am I black or am I white? And the requirement is that when I look from the outside at the result, at the outputs, then the set of black nodes are, in fact, a maximal independent set. Okay? So they themselves do not know the entire independent set, nor do they know the graph. Um, they just output their own output. And the requirement is that everyone that said uh, black, all this set of nodes, is a maximal independent set in the graph. Okay? And the complexity that we, that we care about is the number of rounds of communication that it took us until everyone has an output. Okay? So I don't care about the local computation here. I'm giving you that for free. I'm only counting communication. And the, the, the motivation for this is that um, typically in these, in these networks, what really takes uh, um, power and time and uh, other resources is, is the communication and not the local computation. This takes it to the, ex to the extreme and says, hey, you can do whatever local computation you want for free. Okay? So I only care about the number of rounds. Okay, so how do we find uh, a maximal independent set in a distributed setting? Okay, so here's a naive solution. Um, we simply simulate the, the sequential algorithm. Okay? This can be done very easily. Suppose we have um, an order of the nodes. There are various ways to, to get this. Suppose they have unique IDs between 1 and n. And here is the size of the graph, the number of nodes. Um, then uh, this guy, number 1, says, I'm first, I go in. Uh, number 2 says, I already have a neighbor that's in, so I go out. And how do they know that they send a message, right? So one sends a message to, to its neighbors, look, I'm in. Okay. Two here sends a message to its neighbors, I'm out. Then three says, okay, I have a node uh, before me, but it's out, so I go in. Sends a message, so now four and seven know that they can go out. And so on. Okay, so basically simulating the sequential algorithm here, and the time it takes me in the worst case is uh, linear in the number of nodes. Okay, I just go one by one over the nodes. So that's a very uh, easy solution. Um, the problem is that while a linear number of rounds is great in sequential algorithms, um, I'm preparing the, the background for Dana's talk, uh, it's great for sequential algorithms. It's in P, it's very fast. Um, in distributed algorithms, it's not acceptable. Why? It doesn't scale with the size of the network. Okay, so we don't, so this graph is not sort of our input, it's our network. And our net, network can actually grow a lot and change and we don't want the time that it takes us to uh, get a solution to be linear in the size of the network. For example, we would like things to behave logarithmically. Okay, so that would scale well, even if I double the size of the network, I don't really increase my, uh, um, my complexity. And in fact, we can find an MIS in a distributed setting in a log logarithmic number of rounds. So this is a classic result by Luby, it's from 30 years ago. Um, I'm not gonna prove it, I'm just gonna tell you um, what it is. Um, okay, light in my face. Um, so here's what we do. We loop over the following, um, uh, the following oops, round of communication. I choose a random number, so even if I have ID nows, I ignore them for a minute. Okay, so just, you don't really need them 
Okay. Um, I choose a random number. I send it to all my neighbors, and I receive all the random numbers of my neighbors. And if I'm a local maxima, I only know my neighbors, so I don't know if I'm the maxima in the entire graph. But if I'm a local maxima, I tell all my neighbors, look, I'm in. Okay, I'm going to go into the MIS. And then they, they tell all they, their neighbors, I'm going to be white. I'm going to go outside of the MIS. It's very easy to check that, um, that I don't take two nodes into the MIS that are neighbors. Right? They can't both be local maxima. Um, and then what, the only thing that happens here is that I might not finish after one iteration of this. Right? I can have a sequence of nodes um, that each one has a higher uh, random number, and then none of them is a local maxima. Okay? So I just need to iterate over this a few times, and it can be shown, I'm not going to show, but it can be shown that, uh, it can be shown that with high probability in each one of these iterations, I take a constant fraction, actually of the edges, out of the graph. Okay, so the graph, uh, in some sense, shrinks by a constant factor. So I only need the logarithmic number of rounds to complete. Okay? Um, so that's the basic sort of distributed algorithm uh, for solving an MIS. Um, we have another, we have some other, okay, so it's also, there's actually, it was also proven by Alon Babay and Itai, and there's also another paper, they're all from 86, they all revolve around the same ideas. There are slight variants for this, but this is the basic idea of breaking symmetry in, in log n rounds, log n phases. Um, there was a bunch of other works, I didn't write all the, the literature here. Um, uh, last year there was um, um, this work by Guffrey who actually showed that you can solve it at almost logarithmic in delta. Delta here is the maximal degree of the graph. It can be n in the worst case, but it could be much smaller. So basically, this is um, this would be better in some cases. Uh, there's this, uh, you know, two to the order of square root of log log n. This is something that is um, larger than poly log log, but it's smaller than any log uh, than any poly log, right? So it's very small. Um, so in this sense, um, MIS is local. Okay, it's a local problem. We don't really need to process the entire graph at each node in order to solve the problem. Okay? Uh, we can do it in a, in a number of rounds that is logarithmic in the size of the network. Okay? Um, the reason, and, and this problem is, is important in the uh, distributed setting also because it has many applications. So if you consider um, the edges of the graph as a shared resource that can't be used at the same time, so if you want to have active nodes that don't use the same resources at the same time, you really need a, uh, actually an MIS. Okay? So it has applications for distributed computing. It's also um, a central problem because um, it's actually open how fast can you solve it. Okay? So we know how to solve it in log n rounds, uh, but our lower bounds are not there yet. So we have lineal lower, lower bound. Lineal's lower bound is also almost 30 years old now. Um, and this is a log star and lower bound. This is a holds even for rings and for a path. Okay, very simple graphs. You still need uh, some communication. You can't solve it in a constant number of rounds. And then we have um, this lower bound of Kuhn, Mossiburna, and Wattenhofer, which says that you need, so in terms of delta, this is almost tight. Okay, you need log delta rounds, so you only have this small factor here. Um, in terms of n, what we know is that we need at least square root of log n. Okay, so we have a gap here between square root of log n and log n, and it seems that our current techniques are insufficient for closing this. So it seems like we really um, need something new in order to get the, to get the right bound. Now, um, this is uh, referring to randomized algorithm. If we look at deterministic algorithms, um, these are still the best known lower bounds, and the upper bounds are much, much higher. Okay, so there are really big gaps here. And this is also true for other local problems in distributed settings. Um, so this is maybe less related to the topic of this talk, but if someone is looking for interesting things to work on, then there's really a bunch of open and central problems here to, to look at. Um, okay, so that's basically um, the distributed setting. I don't know if there are any questions about this. Again, I would be really happy if uh, people ask stuff or, I don't know, um,
comment. Um, okay, I'm going to go now and talk about the dynamic setting. Okay, the dynamic setting um, is also distributed. The, the model of communication is the same. We have a graph. We have a process at each node of the graph, and they communicate um, by sending messages. They have the same global clock, and I'm counting rounds. Okay. Um, in this setting, I have a graph and I have an NMIS. Okay, I have a solution, and now I go and change the graph. Okay, so it's this graph again. We're going to see it like almost on every slide of this talk. Um, I'm going to remove. I'm going to make one topology change. Say I remove this node, and I'm asking um, how long does it take me to fix the solution? And when I say fix, I mean I want the nodes to communicate and maybe change their outputs if they need to, and the result has to be an MIS. It doesn't have to be related to the previous MIS. Uh, so the question was whether I consider a single change. It's an excellent question. It refers to the last slide. So this talk will be about a single change. Um, we're actually doing work in progress about handling more than a single change, and we have some uh, nice results about that, but they're not totally written down yet, so I don't want to commit about them. That's a very good question. So I'm going to assume now a single topology change. Um, okay. So I mean, um, it could be either a single removal, a single removal of a node, a single removal of an edge, um, a single insertion of a new node with how many edges you want, or a single insertion of an edge. Okay. Um, actually, in the distributed setting, it also matters when you remove an, a node. There are also two cases for that. So the node can say, hey guys, I want to leave now, so let's talk for a few rounds and uh, you know, fix whatever we need to fix before I leave. That would be graceful, you know, graceful um, departure or something like that. And then it could be, you know, I crash, I just caught fire, I don't have time to um, tell everyone how to fix the solution. I just go down, my neighbors realize that I'm down, and they need to fix the solution, and now they can sort of communicate through this node that was, um, uh, that crashed. So these are two sort of separate type of, of changes. Um, from, the, from the graph point of view, what happens is that I remove a node or insert an edge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk mostly about removing a node, but yes, it could be any of these changes. Um, I also see that the node, which uh, before it disappears, uh, gives in a consistent... Uh, That's true. We don't, we don't consider this one. Okay, we don't consider a malicious node, but we do consider um, leaving by crashing when you don't have time to fix things. Um, okay, so, so in this case, this is very easy. Uh, what I would like to do is simply have, I mean, these nodes, they, this uh, neighboring MIS node is out, but they have their other neighboring MIS nodes, so they're fine. I don't care that I took this one out. But this node now needs to enter. So if this guy says, okay, I'm going to enter the MIS, then we're fine. We fix the solution. Okay? So basically, I'm, I'm assuming that if I took out this node, then these guys, the neighbors, get some indication of that. Otherwise, okay, otherwise I can't do much. They get some indication that something has changed. Now this guy says, okay, I need to change my state, tells its neighbors, I'm changing my state, I'm entering the MIS now, and now we're fine. Okay, no one has to do anything else. Okay, um, so this looks easy, okay? And when we started working about on this, it seemed very easy. You basically, th this is a local problem, not only in the sense that you can solve in a logarithmic number of rounds, it's, it really is local, sort of you can, you know, you can check if, you're, if, if the MIS is correct in your neighborhood just by looking at what your output is and your uh, neighbor's output is, okay? And basically, there are really a number of easy scenarios here. So if I insert a node, it is very easy. So let, let's look at, um, at this example. Um, suppose I insert this, this node over here. It's, it's white, but it's just because it didn't decide yet. Um, um, it just looks at, at its neighbors. If it has a neighbor in the MIS, then it stays out. Okay? It sends them, a, maybe it sends them a message, you know. Maybe they learn that it's in, but if it doesn't say anything, then they, um, it, it, they learn that there's a new node that, it's, that is their neighbor. But if the, it doesn't say anything in the next round, then they realize that it's not in the MIS. 
Okay? If none of its neighbors are in the MIS, then it has to be in the MIS, and then it has to send them a message, look, I'm your neighbor and I'm getting into the MIS. They need that because later on I might change things and they need to know that they have this neighbor in the MIS. Okay, so that's very easy. Um, within one round of communication and basically one bit of saying I'm in, um, we, we solve the, we fix this MIS with a new node, okay? Um, edge removal is also easy, okay? So here's an edge that I remove, and let's consider one of its endpoints. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this one uh, circled one. Um, it can't be that both of them were in the MIS. This is just, you know, as a sanity check, because before I removed this edge, I had a, a valid MIS. Okay, so this cannot be the case. So suppose um, I remove this edge and this guy is in the MIS. Then it simply stays in, right? I only took uh, um, a restriction out. So I have less restrictions. There's no reason for anything to change for this guy, okay? Um, it didn't have a neighbor in the MIS before. I took out an edge, so it certainly doesn't have a neighbor in the MIS now, okay? Um, suppose it wasn't in the MIS, then I look at its remaining neighbors. If one of them in, is in the MIS, then it stays out. Okay? And it could, it could also be that this guy was in the MIS before. But it's okay. If it, if it has still another neighbor in the MIS, it stays out. Um, if it doesn't, okay, and I added this node just to sort of excuse why these guys are, are, are out, because they have another neighbor in. So, uh, if this guy doesn't have any of the remaining neighbors in the MIS, then it has to go in, okay? And now this edge is gone, so this is not a violation, okay? Make sense? Okay. Um, so yeah, these two things are easy. Uh, node insertion and edge removal can be solved within a single round and sending one bit of information. That's very easy. Um, but what about node deletions and edge insertions? Okay, so spoiler, these are hard. Uh, what do I mean by hard? Suppose I take out this node, and suppose, I mean, if I take out a node that wasn't in the MIS, I don't change anything, right? I don't need, have to do anything, I'm fine. But if it was in the MIS, here's my problem. I need to look now at all of its neighbors. All of them are out. They have to be out because this guy was in the MIS. And each of them has to look at their remaining neighbors and basically do the same rule we said before, right? If this guy has neighbors here, has at least one neighbor here in the MIS, it stays white. Um, otherwise, if all of its neighbors are white, then it has to become black, has to enter the MIS. Now in this uh, nice drawing, this again takes a single round, right? But these guys can be connected among themselves. And now suppose that both this guy and this guy do not have any remaining neighbor in the MIS. I cannot color both of them black. Yeah. Might be annoying the last step because uh, if you have only this black one and you connect like ten whites with your insertion method, uh, you could have all of them black and send one white, and you're not going to get it with this insertion method. How is this maximal step? It's maximal. I think I'm missing your, the point of your question. He's confusing the maximal and maximum. Okay. 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 Maximal independent set is not maximum. Maximum means the independent set of largest size in the graph. So suppose you have a star graph, you need to take the leaves, okay? Maximal independent set is an independent set which you cannot add nodes to. So you can take the center, okay? So the center would be fine. It would not be a maximum independent set in a star, but it would be a maximal independent set, okay? Uh, it's a very good point. We do not deal with maximum. Maximum is hard, even in a sequential setting, certainly in a distributed setting, because it's a sort of a global property, because you need to count things throughout the graph. Okay, it's a totally different problem. Okay, so suppose these two do not have any neighbor, any remaining neighbor after this guy is gone in the MIS, then I can't put both of them in, because I would violate this restriction. Okay, so they need to decide which one goes in. And in general, the, the neighborhood of, of this removed node can have a linear size, okay? And it can have any structure. This sort of induced subgraph can have any structure, okay? And I need to coordinate who goes in, who goes out. You can run the same algorithm only on the subgraph of the neighbors. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so this is what we knew how to do so far. There's a topology change in the graph. We have a static MIS algorithm. Run it on the neighborhood of the removed node. 
Okay, that's a perfect solution. It's pretty fast, right? It's logarithmic in the size of the graph. Okay, so it's pretty quick. Um, and we don't have to do anything, uh, anything new. We have these nice algorithms. Okay, so that's a very good uh, solution. Um, however, we can do better. Okay, so our solution um, that I want to talk about today is uh, ma uh, what it does, it maintains a random greedy MIS. Okay, so let me explain, explain what a random greedy MIS is and how we maintain it. So, so I have a, a random order. If I want to uh, explain your algorithm, what happens if you had one node which was a uh, black and it was connected to all other nodes? Mm -hmm. Then once you remove it, you start from scratch and therefore you cannot do any better than going over the whole graph uh, once again. Yes, so but... Are you trying to uh, uh, restrict the degree, for example, so that my example will not apply? No, 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 I'm not restricting the degree. I'm going to have um, uh, an MIS that it, the probability of the MIS to look like that is going to be uh, small. Okay, I'm going to maintain random greedy. So the probability that this is my MIS is small, and now the topology change would have to be oblivious to my random. The graph, uh, it's very unlikely that one node connected to everyone will be chosen black, yes. and all others remain white. Yes, and the reason is that I maintain random greedy, but let's go a little bit slower. Okay, so that's a very good point. In the worst case, if I just had a, a, a random MIS, then I basically can do better than our lower bounds. Okay, for the static case. But I make sure that, uh, that I have some probability on the MIS that I have. It's not any arbitrary MIS. Um, and in that uh, case, it's very unlikely that this will happen. Okay? And I, ha I need, an, as the, the bad guy that makes the topology changes has to be oblivious to the, my random MIS. So we can know the graph structure, but not what my MIS is. Okay, so what is random greedy? So let's ignore uh, for a second the, the computation model, the dynamic distributed model, just random greedy. So in random greedy, we have um, a, a random order of the nodes. Um, it happens to be the order I showed before, but it's totally random. And the, the MIS of, this, uh, of a particular permutation is just the, the one that I explained before. So I, every node is in the MIS, if and only if none of its lower order neighbors are in the MIS. Okay, that's the rule. So if you give me a permutation, I give you uh, an MIS that results from it, okay? Um, and now, in our dynamic setting, we don't really need to know what the permutation is. We only need to know the order between ourselves and our neighbors, okay? So that's easy to implement, because I can't know the entire permutation. I don't even know what the graph is, okay? But I never need to know the, 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 the entire permutation. I only need to know uh, the relation, the, the order between myself and my neighbors. So that's easy to implement. And again, I do it by choosing a random number. Okay? And when I enter the, the graph, I just exchange enough bits until we broke symmetry with all my neighbors and I know which one is smaller than me or lower order than me and which one is larger. Okay? Um, and this is what our algorithm does. So we do restrict ourselves in that when I fix the MIS after a change, it's not enough that I have any new valid MIS, it has to be the random greedy one, okay? But this allows me, the fact that it's the random greedy one, allows me to argue that I don't need to make too many changes to the graph after um, a topology change. Okay, so this is my main theorem. And this is totally a combinatorial uh, statement, okay? There's some additional details of how to implement this in the dynamic setting, which I'm not gonna go into. They're a, a bit delicate, but the intuition, I think, is, is, should be pretty clear. The, the combinatorial statement is that if you have a graph and you, you have an MIS that is a result of a random permutation, okay, and you make a single topology change, which could be inserting or deleting a node or an edge, and you wanna look at the set of nodes whose state, like black or white, black or white, I need to change in order to maintain the, the property that I have a, a, an MIS that is based on this random greedy permutation, then in expectation, I need to update only a single node. Okay? So totally combinatorial statement. Yeah. Just a quick question. Could there be an MIS which is not greedy? Uh, no. You, for, I mean, you can find, if you take an MIS in a graph, you can find an order that gives that MIS. Okay? But... Um, you know the black ones is the first thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you go, you, you need to, if you take an MIS, you can find a permutation that gives it. 
I might be asking a question about something that you're about to talk about. But These are a good questions. But nevertheless, uh, you were saying that the adversary is oblivious to the random labels. Uh, but is it adaptive? Does it see, uh, can it try to learn the labels by removing it? No, 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 it does. I assume that it's, um, for now I'm going to look at this one shot case. Okay, so it doesn't learn anything. And if I want it, if, I, if I'm looking over time, then I have to, ha to I need to make sure that it doesn't see the communication. Okay? So it can't learn anything. It knows, it can only know, it can't, what it can know is what the graph is. That's fine with me. Okay? But it doesn't know um, what the MIS is. But it's not allowed to introduce change before the thing stabilizes, right? So right. Right. That's, that, that relates to the point of having a single change at a time. Okay? Um, but here's the thing. In expectation, I have a single update. So I'll need a single round in order to, f to stabilize. So I'm not even using the word stabilize. Um, there's, for, for, for those who do know the literature of distributed computing, there's a whole field of self-stabilization, but it's slightly different than here. So I'm not going to call it stabilizing. And I'm, I need to make sure that the next topology change comes only after we have a, a, a stable MIS, stable, a good MIS, a valid MIS, okay? Um, so this is the main theorem. Um, if there are any question about, questions about the statement, now is a good time because I'm going to try to convince you why it's true. Is there a high probability bound? No, and we can actually show that you can't have a high probability bound. We have examples for that. Mm -hmm. No bound whatsoever. No, no, no. That I, I mean, you you will always have. Um, uh, no, I mean, you can find high probability bound for log n, but not for for constant expectation. So we have, so we can show that um, you will uh, have changes which require even a linear number of adjustments. Okay, just in expectation, you will have a single update. everyone else, and it being chosen as black, uh, <laughs> in any random ordering, it will be chosen yes. first with probability yeah. 1 over n. Mm -hmm. So with probability 1 over n, you'll have to uh, start from scratch. Yeah. So you cannot have an exponential. Okay. So, so the property of random reading in MIS, is it maintained after the change? Yes, yes. Okay, I sort of restrict myself if I'm saying that, because now I don't just have to fix the MIS, I have to fix it so it will still be random greedy. Uh, but it helps me in you know, saying that the next topology change, this is also the case. Okay, okay. so um, we improved the logarithmic solution of just implementing the static uh, distributed setting from algorithmic to constant round solution. This is actually an expectation of one round solution. Okay, if I need to change one node, it just tells all its neighbors, look, I'm going in to the MIS or I'm going out. Okay. Um, proof. Um, I don't know, how much time do I have? Okay, 15, okay. So, okay, so let's see where we get to with the proof. Um, I won't have a lot of notations. I'll need only four. These are three of them. Here's my random order over nodes. And again, it's not known to the nodes, just the rel relative order to the neighbors. Um, here's the node at which the change occurred. Um, let's assume that we're removing a node. Okay, that was one of the hard examples. Even if I remove an edge, I can also consider only one endpoint as the problematic one. Okay, because it would be the one with the higher order in the permutation. The one with the lower order does it didn't care about that constraint anyway. Okay, um, but for now, if if you didn't follow what I just said, just assume that we're deleting a node. Okay, so that's V, and here's the set of nodes that needs to adjust. So it depends on the random permutation. It depends on which node I removed from the graph. Okay, and here's this theorem that I showed you earlier in the mathematical notation. So the expectation over all random orders of the size of the set of nodes that need to adjust is at most one. Now, I'm going to say S because it's easier, but I do want to keep the notation pi and V here for a reason, okay? Um, so when I say S, I mean S pi V. Um, okay, so let's look at what is S pi V. Okay, so here's our um, example again, and we remove that, the, the node three. And remember, I told you that in order to fix the MIS, we only have to uh, put node seven into the MIS. But now I'm maintaining random greedy. Okay, so node four also has to go in when I remove node three, because now node four does not have a neighbor with a lower order in the MIS. 
Okay, so, so this is a crucial point here. I need to maintain random greedy. So nodes four and seven needs to, need to change their state. Okay, node two is fine because um, uh, it still has a lower order neighbor in the MIF, so I don't care about it. Okay, so these guys need to uh, enter the MIF. They need to become black. They tell all the neighbors, but for now, again, forget the distributed setting. Okay. Okay, I'm not done. I'm not done. Here, five five goes out, six goes in, okay, and seven goes out again. Okay, uh, that's a, a very good point. This was just the beginning, just to argue that four has to go out. Although, if I just wanted any MIS, I would be fine with it. Okay. Um, so notice here that node seven was uh, white before the change and white after I, I fixed it but I'm still counting it in the set of nodes that had to sort of adjust because they, if I translate, translate this to a distributed setting, then I need to send messages between all of their nodes and this guy will play a role here. But I do need to, it's enough that I count it only once, okay? This, this, why I can count it only one depends on how I implement this in the distributed setting, which I'm gonna skip. But um, my po the point is that I care about the size of this set, okay? The set of nodes that during this process that I described of fixing the M random greedy MIS solution had to change their state, maybe back and forth, but at least once. Okay, so here V was this node uh, with order three and S by V is this, okay? Uh, good. Okay, so here's the last notation that I promised. So S pi V was the set of nodes that need to adjust. And the last notation I need is S pi V prime. What is S pi V prime? It's the same as S pi V only the permutation is slightly different. What is the new permutation? It's the, the same relative order between all nodes, except now um, suppose pi v was small. So suppose the order of v was zero, okay? And then I look, if I took v out of the graph, I'm gonna show this in a picture first, uh, in, a, in a second. If I take v out of the graph and suppose that it was smaller than all of the nodes, what would I have to change in the graph? And the set that I would have to change, I call it S pi V prime. And again, I'm gonna say just S prime, but I wanna keep the notation, okay? Um, so notice that it depends on pi and V. The only thing it doesn't depend of on is the real order of pi V, because I'm just making V be the smallest order, and then I, I check what is the set of nodes that change, okay? Why do I care about S pi V? And I'm gonna show you uh, in a picture uh, in a second. Um, wrong button. So here's my claim, here's all the math notation we're going to see. So my claim is that the real set of nodes that I have to adjust is either empty, in case suppose I took out a node that is not in the MIS, I don't need to adjust anything, or it's actually equal to this set, as if V had the lowest order, okay, among all the nodes in the graph, okay? Once I prove this, then I want to know what the expectation of the, size is, of, of the size of S is, then I only need to check what is the probability that it's the same as S prime, okay? And my claim will be that um, the probability that they're equal, the probability that this happens, is at most the probability that the order of V is really the minimal among all the nodes in S pi, in S pi V prime, okay? So I defined S prime as a set of nodes that need to adjust if V was the smallest of the graph. And from the proof of this claim, which I'll try to show you, it turns out that this equality happens if the, the can only happen if the real order of V is actually the smallest of a, among all of these, okay? Once I show these two things, what is the probability that uh, pi of v is the minimal of this order? It's gonna be one over the size of the set, and then I'm done. So s is either, the size of s is either zero, or with probability one over the size of the set, it's the size of the set, s prime, okay? So that will be the outline that I'm gonna try to convince you in. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at s, pi, s uh, prime over here. So here's my assumption, I take v, I suppose now it's not three, it's zero. Okay, so it's smaller than everyone in the graph, and now I check what happens if I remove it. So now all of these behave the same because they were smaller, but now I have to check node two because now node two does depend on this link. It did not depend on this link before because three was larger, but now I'm assuming this is a zero. 
so it does depend on this, this link. However, it still remains out because it still has a lower order node that's in the MIS, okay? So I don't care that, I changed, that it had two in the MIS and I removed one because still one of them is in the MIS. So in this example, uh, indeed, S prime is the same as S. And my argument is that this is not a coincidence, okay? It's either empty, for example, if I took out a white node, or it's um, uh, the exact same set as this, okay? So let me try and quickly prove this. So here's the claim, the, the claim that I said. Um, S it is either, either empty or equal to S, pi, S prime, okay? So if v, the real order of V is indeed the minimal of all this set, which is indeed the case in the example we showed, right? Because three is the minimal of all of S prime then there are two possibilities. Well, if V was white in the first place, so it wasn't in the nodes that had to change when I took the real order pi, then fine, I don't need to change anything if I, if I took out a white node. So that, that's easy. If V was black, which is what happens here, then by induction, I show over these sort of layers that S, uh, is equal, SI is equal SI prime, okay? So first V is in both sets, okay? Then I look at its neighbors, four and seven, that needed to change their state. And my claim is that they're both in S and both in S prime. Then I look at their neighbors that needed to change, which is five. That's the next layer, okay? And that will be the same in both. And then six, and then seven again. Seven is, in also, is both in the first layer and in the one, two, three, fourth layer here, okay? Um, so by induction, I'm not gonna show this. This is just a bit technical, but by induction, I can show that these sets are the same. So really, if V really is the minimal among all of, among all of these, then the sets are equal, okay? If it's, not, if it's not the minimal, then my argument is that S is empty to begin with, okay? Let me quickly show, uh, show you why. So I'm gonna look at S prime, and I'm gonna look at W in that set S prime, which is the minimal one. It's not V anymore, okay? V is in S prime, but it's not the minimal, okay? The, the real value of V was three, okay? And suppose it wasn't the minimal in S prime. Okay, first claim is that W is connected to, uh, to V, okay? Why? Because W changes its state, it's an S prime, okay? And it's the minimal one. If it's not connected to V, then it changes its state because someone else changes its state, and that someone else has to have a lower order, okay? But W is the one with a minimal lower order in S prime. So it has to be because of V itself, okay? Second argument is that W has to be in the MIS, and this is because, suppose it wasn't, then it would have a neighbor U that was in the MIS, okay? And U has to have a smaller order, okay, for W to be out. But U cannot be a, a node in S prime because W is the minimal one in S prime. So U is fixed, even if I change V, U remains in the MIS. And then W remains out of the MIS, even if I change V, because it has U as a lower order node that is in the MIS, okay. So we have W in the MIS, and now the last argument is this. W did not change its state in the original uh, permutation because it had a lower order than V, okay? So it doesn't depend on V, okay? So it has to be that V doesn't change its state in the original permutation because it has a neighbor with a lower order that is fixed in the MIS, okay? So basically we get that no one had to really change their state. Basically it says, V had to be white before the change, so if I took it out, I don't need, don't need to change anything, okay? This was the technical part. Now let's go wrap up. Um, I claim that we're done. What is the probability that S is equal S prime? Well, it's the probability that V um, is really the lower order among all of S prime. And if I take a random permutation, I take a set of size 10, and I take a particular element, what's the probability that it's um, the smallest one in that set? It's one over 10, okay? I'm lying here. Can someone tell me why, where is the lie? Hint, I insisted on having these pi and v all along slides. Okay. <clears throat> Um, S prime is not just a set, a random set of nodes. S prime depends on the permutation pi, okay? So given S prime, not every permutation pi is now possible, okay? S prime is uh, defined with respect to pi, 
So it gives me some information on pi. So I can't just go over all random permutation and ask, well, what's the probability that this node out of a set of 10 nodes is the minimal, uh, um, has the minimal order, okay? Because I have some information now on the permutation. It's not a uniform random permutation anymore, okay? So we have to be really careful here. However, and I won't show you this, it still holds that the probability that V is the minimal one is indeed one over the size of the set, okay? And the reason for this is that while we do get information on pi, pi is, when I have S prime, pi is not, uh, not anymore uniformly random. The information that we get is only on the order within S prime, well, except for V because we sort of made it zero. The order within S prime, we, we, know, uh, uh, we know about this information, and the order outside of S prime, we know about that information. But we don't learn anything about the order between nodes in and out of S prime, between pairs of nodes. And that is why we don't get any information on whether V, uh, we don't get any um, change of distribution on whether V is the minimal in the set or not, okay? Quick example, um, here these two sort of tails look the same, right? There's a node uh, in the MIS and one node out, but here two was smaller than three, nine is larger than seven. I, don't, I, I cannot distinguish this just by saying two and nine remain out, okay? Um, the reason is that two only cares that it's out because of this node over here, and nine only cares that it's out because of this node over here. So I do know, if I know that this is S prime, and I know what the graph is, um, I do know that um, two has a neighbor here that is smaller, but I have no way of telling whether two was larger or smaller than, um, than this guy over here, okay? For example, if it was nine and this was eight, they would still be, eight would be in and nine would be out, okay? So that's the main point here. And then we really get um, that it holds that the, the probability that V is the minimal is one over the size of the set, okay? Um, this is a proof sort of uh, very hand wavy. Is, uh, the technical details are in the paper if you're interested in, but I think this gives the flavor of where you have to be cautious when you work with um, uh, random distributions. Um, okay, and that really gives us what we claim. That basically gives us uh, the proof. Okay, and basically I'm done. Okay, so if you need to remember only one thing from my talk, then I'd be happy if it's this combinatorial statement. If you have a solution to a random greedy MIS, okay, and you make a single topology change, in expectation, you only need to update a single node. Um, there's more stuff in the paper. This, when you turn this into a distributed algorithm, you also get some nice property of uh, history independence. So sort of, if I make changes, I can't sort of lead you into a particular MIS because you have a random permutation, um, which I could do, say, if you had a deterministic solution. I'm, I'm not gonna, um, uh, I don't have time to talk about this, but there's some cute property, properties that arise here. Um, open problems, which is um, one part that I, I, I always wait for when I hear a, um, a talk. Um, so um, as, uh, as uh, Adi asked, uh, more than a single topology change. What if I do two changes before I do, the, I do the second one, maybe at the same time of the first one, and in particular before I fix the first solution, okay? Um, can I still have a good bound on what we can do? Because I, I really, this proof really uh, heavily use the fact that it's a single update, okay? So um, we think we have some nice results here, but it's sort of work in progress. Um, there are many open questions here. Here are some, like two bullets, but each bullet has many open questions inside of it, right? So uh, more problems, okay? Coloring, maxi maximal matching, these are all, all local problems in the di distributed setting, and it's uh, an interesting question what can be done here. Okay, so we worked on it a little bit, but we actually couldn't beat the static solutions yet. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, things behave slightly different there. Um, and centralized dynamic algorithms. So uh, dynamic algorithms is, is a very uh, wide area also in centralized solutions. So you run a sequential algorithm, you need to maintain a solution, and now I change the graph and you need to fix it. Why can't you use what I just showed? Okay, the reason is that if I have a single update, then in a distributed setting, this guy sends a message to all of his neighbors in a single round telling them, I'm going into the MIS or I'm going out of the MIS and I'm done. 
in a sequential setting, that's not the case. I have a single process, right, that runs over the nodes. And now if I have a single change, I have to sort of look at its neighbors, okay, and make sure that they don't need to change. In the distributed setting, they just don't respond. They get this information that this neighbor changed, and they say, fine, but I'm still fine. I don't need to change anything. They just keep quiet, and I don't have communication. In a sequential setting, I need to check whether the neighbors have to change or not. Okay? So this would take me delta rounds, this single, this single update. Um, and it's a good question what you can do in a, in a sequential uh, setting. Um, and that's basically all I have. So um, thanks for your attention. The lengths of the messages in this protocol. <coughs> if I understand correctly, the messages are really short in the protocol. These are one bit broadcast messages. If you look at the static setting, um, the upper bounds we have, uh, um, so in the upper bounds we have, we can even, it's, it takes some work to get the log n round complexity to a single bit, but you can do that. Okay, there, are, there are papers that do that. The original algorithm was just, didn't assume any bound on messages. They can be easily bounded by log n bits, but you can even reduce it to a constant number of bits in a message uh, with some work, it takes some work. Um, and our lower bounds, and we don't know how to improve that if we allow, uh, allow even unbounded size messages, okay? And our lower bounds hold for unbounded size messages because they're sort of indistinguishability based lower bounds. Okay, so I basically don't, cannot distinguish between two graphs in which I need to give different answers. Running this dynamic algorithm for many, many steps, much longer than say n, mm -hmm. then maybe at that point. The That's a good question. We didn't try to learn the graph, uh, but also let me let me mention that if I run it for many steps, not all of them are going to take me a constant round number of rounds, right? Because this is an expectation, and I can actually show that at some point I will need a lot more rounds, a lot of more rounds. Okay. If you look for uh, additional extensions. You might consider the case in which you have some a priori knowledge of the probability that each node is going to uh, fail. Uh, so uh, looking at your proof, uh, you can choose an ordering of the nodes in such a way that those that are more likely to fail will occur later on in the sequence. Uh, because uh, as you showed, it is only those which are later on in their numbers higher numbers which might be affected. So if they are close to the end, the number of those who might be affected is smaller. Mm -hmm. And you can do it uh, without knowing a priori what's the probability of failure if you are doing a self-organizing uh, sorting algorithm. Everyone which fails uh, and later will be revived and re-enter and then it will fail again, etc. Every time it fails, it goes to the end. It chooses uh, a number which is uh, at the end of the sequence the current sequence. So the ordering of uh, the names of the vertices will be such that automatically those that tend to fail often... If there is some tendency to fail for certain nodes. Uh, yes, okay. Yep. You might consider the case in which uh, you don't look at uh, arbitrary failures, yes. but failures which follow some probabilistic model. Yeah. I mean, these failures can even be adversarial um, in terms of the graph itself. They can't know my probabilities, but that's true. If, if, if a node that fails has a tendency to fail later on, then yes, I can actually learn that and uh, do clever things. That's a good point. That's interesting to look at. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.